SpaceX's Starbase facility is in full swing with preparations for the upcoming second Starship test flight, which could happen as early as September. Super Heavy Booster 9 was rolled out to the launch site on Tuesday, August 22, in preparation for a repeat of its pre-launch static fire test. Booster 9's first static fire test was cut short on August 6, when four of the booster's 33 engines shut down prematurely, prompting a test abort and shutdown of all remaining 29 engines. Although the exact cause of the premature shutdown of those four engines is unknown, there are some signs that there may have been a problem with the 20 booster quick disconnect mechanisms on the orbital launch mount. These mechanisms are used to inject high-pressure helium into the booster's outer 20 Raptor engines in order to start their pumps, as well as to supply the high-pressure gaseous oxygen and gaseous methane required for the pre-burner torch igniters. If one of these were to fail, the Raptor engine they're connected to would not start up properly and would likely shut down. Several booster quick disconnect purge tests were conducted after the failed static fire test, most likely to fix the issues and verify the performance. Booster 9 was rolled back to the production site on August 7, the day after the static fire test. While at the production site, the vehicle underwent further work to prepare it for flight, including the addition of its hot staging ring and the closeout of several of its systems. The hot staging technique involves igniting the engines on the Starship's upper stage just before stage separation, potentially increasing the Starship's payload to orbit by 10%, as thrusting will not be paused during flight. The interstage ring installed on top of the Super Heavy will allow the exhaust from the Starship to escape during hot staging. The ring features customized truss work and a stainless steel dome inside, with a flatter head. The dome is designed to protect the top of the booster, which houses different electrical and mechanical components, from Starship exhaust. After arriving at the launch site on Tuesday afternoon, Booster 9 was moved between the launch tower arms to begin lifting operations. Several hours later, the arms slowly lifted the booster and placed it on the orbital launch mount. A Booster 9 spin prime test was conducted on Wednesday evening, involving an unknown number of engines. During the test, a small amount of propellant is flown through the turbopumps of the booster engines to validate the plumbing and engine spin-up. Booster 9 conducted a static test firing of the Raptor engines with the water deluge in use on Friday, August 25th. Similar to the first static fire on August 6, the second test focused on firing all 33 engines with a stress test of the water deluge system, as well as the reworked launch mount itself. The successful firing of all 33 engines for full test duration confirms that SpaceX had fixed all engine and ground support system issues that occurred during the first test earlier this month. Starship 25 continues to be prepared for flight at the Rocket Garden. Teams are installing the remaining thermal protection system tiles on the nose cone lift points of the ship and performing internal work on its payload bay section to prepare the vehicle for flight. Ship 25 will soon return for stacking atop Booster 9, which will allow for fit checks with the hot staging ring and the ship quick disconnect, which has been moved higher on the tower to accommodate the added height of the installed ring. The full stack will be followed by a wet dress rehearsal, which will involve fully loading propellants into the booster and ship, as well as providing a launch day rehearsal for the controllers. The wet dress rehearsal is the final pre-launch test before the Starship takes to the skies. CEO Elon Musk recently posted an X that the next Starship launch will happen soon. However, we still have no information on when the FAA will award SpaceX a launch license. The FAA is currently reviewing the final mishap investigation report from the April launch, which SpaceX recently submitted to the agency. After studying the report, the FAA will determine what fixes SpaceX needs to make in order to receive authorization to launch again. The target launch date for Starship's second flight has been recently shifted because of the need to repeat Booster 9's static fire test. A few days after the first static fire test, teams were tracking the end of August for launch, but this has now shifted to no earlier than September 8, as mentioned in the latest Mariner Hazard warning notice from the U.S. Coast Guard. After the Booster 9 static fire test on August 6, SpaceX tested the steel plate water deluge system for the first time on August 18. The test indicated that the deluge system was still functional and did not suffer significant damage during the static fire test. Teams are still in the process of installing the newly delivered deluge system water storage tank. The deluge system's storage capacity and water discharge rate will increase once the tank is fully operational. We can expect more deluge tests before the orbital flight to evaluate the performance of the newly fitted tank. As SpaceX gets ready for Starship's second flight, the company is also preparing for subsequent flights with multiple vehicles in flow at the production facility. Ship 28, which is believed to be a part of Starship's third orbital flight, is currently undergoing engine installation near the rocket garden.
As of August 24, five of its six engines are installed, and the ship is only missing one Raptor vacuum engine. On the other hand, Super Heavy Booster 10 has been moved inside the Mega Bay lately, and teams are preparing the vehicle for engine installation. Static fire tests of Booster 10 and Ship 28 will begin once engine installation is complete. SpaceX aims to launch them within four to six weeks of Booster 9 and Ship 25's flight. Ship 29, now repositioned in the high bay, is receiving the remaining thermal protection system tiles. If this vehicle follows the same timeline as Ship 28, it could be rolled out for cryo-proof tests within a month. SpaceX is progressing well with the expansion of the Star Factory. Teams completely dismantled production tent number two several days ago, and new beams and columns are currently being installed on its footprint for the Star Factory. Since all the ship and booster stacking operations are now taking place inside the high bay and the mega bay, teams have begun demolishing the mid bay. The new mega bay is still under construction. The building is now five levels tall, and once complete, it will have seven levels in total. Teams have begun installing stairways inside the building. Upgrades are also being made to the tank farm and ground support systems at the orbital launch site. A new liquid oxygen pump was installed a few weeks ago to speed up the process of loading liquid oxygen into the launch vehicle. A new heat exchanger was installed at the liquid methane site of the tank farm on August 22. Orbital Tank Farm currently sports four active liquid oxygen heat exchangers and two active liquid methane heat exchangers. The newly installed liquid methane heat exchanger is not active yet. The heat exchangers will lower the temperature of the propellants, allowing to load them at a higher density inside the rocket's tanks. Teams are also preparing the former Starship suborbital landing pad to install cryogenic storage tanks. The upgrades the tank farm receives will increase storage capacity and speed up the loading of propellants into the Starship launch vehicle. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. India's Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft successfully touched down in the southern polar region of the moon last Wednesday, making the country the fourth to achieve a soft landing on the lunar surface. The Chandrayaan-3 mission was launched on 14 July atop a launch vehicle Mark III heavy lift rocket from Satish Dhawan Space Center into an initial highly elliptical Earth orbit. After a series of orbital raising maneuvers followed by a translunar injection burn, the spacecraft entered an elliptical orbit around the Moon on August 5. It then performed multiple maneuvers to shift into a nearly circular path, which took it about 150 kilometers above the lunar surface. On August 17, the Chandrayaan-3 lunar lander, named Vikram, separated from the spacecraft's propulsion module and began its journey towards the lunar surface. While still in orbit around the moon, the lander established contact with the Chandrayaan-2 orbiter, which has been circling the moon since 2019 and will serve as a critical communication link with Earth for the Chandrayaan-3 mission. On August 23, Mission Control at ISRO's headquarters in Bengaluru commanded the lander to begin its descent to the lunar surface, activating its fully automatic landing system. Once the powered descent began, the lander first braked to reduce its height from 30 kilometers to 800 meters above the lunar surface. Then, in preparation for landing, the lander adjusted its orientation so that its altimeters, which measure height to the surface in real time, faced downward. Vikram paused at 150 meters to allow onboard cameras to check for boulders or hazards in the landing zone. The autonomous navigation system then commanded the lander to resume its descent, and the spacecraft touched down in its target landing area at around 70 degrees south latitude. A few hours later, Pragyan, Sanskrit for wisdom, the mission's solar-powered rover, rolled off Vikram and touched the lunar surface. The Vikram lander is equipped with three payloads to record thermal conductivity and sense moonquakes around the landing site, among other data. Pragyan has two instruments on board to conduct on-site experiments, with which scientists hope to gain valuable technical data about the moon's composition near the landing site. As the equipment works on solar energy, the lander and the rover will gather scientific data on the surface for 14 Earth days, equal to one lunar day. The primary function of the propulsion module is to carry the lander module to the 100-kilometer lunar orbit and act as a backup communication relay satellite between lander and Earth. Apart from that, the propulsion module carries one scientific instrument, the spectropolarimetry of habitable planet Earth payload, to study the spectral and polarimetric measurements of Earth from the lunar orbit. The instrument was turned on on August 20, three days after the lander separated from the propulsion module. With the successful landing of Chandrayaan-3, India became the first country to land on the lunar south pole and the fourth to stick a lunar landing, after the United States, the former Soviet Union, and China. A few days before the Chandrayaan-3 landing, Russia unsuccessfully attempted to land its Luna 25 spacecraft on the lunar south pole. 
The Luna 25 spacecraft, launched on August 10 atop a Soyuz 2.1B rocket from the Vostochny Cosmodrome, successfully reached the Moon on August 16 and entered a 90 by 113 km lunar orbit. The 1,750 kg lunar lander was slated to attempt a soft landing on August 21, near Bogoslowski Crater, located approximately 70 degrees south latitude. On August 19, Luna 25 was instructed to fire its engines to send the spacecraft into a pre-landing orbit around the Moon. However, something went wrong, communication with the spacecraft was lost, and it crashed into the Moon. According to preliminary analysis, an engine that was supposed to fire for 84 seconds did so for 127 seconds instead, causing a deviation of the actual parameters of the impulse from those calculated, resulting in the spacecraft impacting the lunar surface. According to the Russian space agency Roscosmos, a specially formed interdepartmental commission will investigate the failed moon landing. If Luna 25 had successfully landed, it would have carried out multiple scientific investigations on the lunar surface for up to a year, utilizing various instruments and a robotic arm. The failure of the mission will be a huge loss to Russia's space ambitions, as it is the country's first attempt to return to the moon since the Soviet Union's Luna 24 mission in 1976. It was planned that after Luna 25, an orbiter named Luna 26 would be sent to the moon, followed by a more powerful lander, Luna 27, and a lunar soil return mission, Luna 28. SpaceX is targeting Saturday, August 26 for the launch of the Crew-7 mission carrying astronauts to the International Space Station for NASA, from Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The mission will send four astronauts representing four different space agencies to the ISS on board Crew Dragon Endurance spacecraft for a roughly six-month stay. As its name suggests, Crew-7 will be SpaceX's seventh operational mission to the space station for NASA, and it will be the 11th human space flight overall for the company. A little more than 12 minutes after launch, the Dragon spacecraft carrying the astronauts will separate from the Falcon 9's upper stage and begin its journey towards the orbiting laboratory. Crew-7 is scheduled to arrive at the space station at 12.50 p.m. UTC on Sunday, August 27. Crew-7 astronauts will have a brief overlap with the members of Crew-6, who are scheduled to depart the ISS on September 1. During their six-month stay at the space station, the Crew-7 astronauts will undertake important scientific missions aimed at advancing human space exploration and improving life on Earth. A Rocket Lab Electron rocket carrying an Earth Observation Radar satellite for the San Francisco company Capella Space lifted off from Rocket Lab's launch complex in New Zealand on Thursday, August 24. The mission, dubbed We Love the Nightlife, was the 40th mission of the two-stage Electron launch vehicle and the first of four dedicated launches for Capella Space. One of the nine Rutherford engines on the Electron's first stage was a spaceflight veteran having launched on a mission in May last year. It was the first time an Electron had flown with a used engine. Stage separation happened about two and a half minutes after liftoff, and the booster descended toward Earth at a speed of nearly 9,000 km per hour, reaching a temperature of 2,400 degrees Celsius along the way. The booster initially deployed its drogue parachute, followed by the main chute, and eventually splashed down in the Pacific Ocean about 11 minutes after liftoff. Rocket Lab recovery teams retrieved the booster from the ocean and brought it onto a vessel using a specially designed capture cradle. The recovery is part of Rocket Lab's ongoing work to make the Electron's first stage reusable. About 58 minutes after liftoff, the rocket's upper stage deployed Capella Space's Acadia Synthetic Aperture Radar Satellite into a 640-kilometer circular orbit. Capella Space intends to offer improved image resolution and quality with its new Acadia Synthetic Aperture Radar Satellite constellation. Capella's advanced radar technology penetrates all weather conditions and captures clear imagery day and night, providing unparalleled insight into what is happening anywhere on the globe at any given moment. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.